Fortescue Bay in southeastern Tasmania. This little bay is really quite a, a special place for me. It's where I first learned to scuba dive. So just right over here, there was a little sand patch that was just nestled amongst the giant kelp forests. And that's where we learnt to take all our gear off underwater and do all the, the drills that you, you learn when you're scuba diving. It was really the only spot in this whole bay here where you could actually do that sort of work because it was so thick with giant kelp forests that the scuba instructor would lose, lose their divers otherwise. It was dark, it was shady but it was amazing. There's a whole bunch of life living within the forest. One thing I really remember vividly is this sort of red algal understory. And you'd look in under the giant kelp trees, essentially, and, and you'd see all these, these crayfish. You didn't see a single urchin back in those days. So this was back in 1998, and I've been diving here in Fortescue Bay every year for the last 24 years. And the changes we've seen here are really profound. This whole little bay here really is a microcosm of the broader change that's happening right across the east coast of Tasmania. What has really changed in recent decades is the increasing problem of the sea urchin. So overgrazing all those kelp beds, which has made us realise that we're actually losing the habitat that's critical and a lot of the biodiversity associated with the kelp. I first started working on the long spine urchin back in, in the early 2000s where we did a coast-wide survey of the long spine urchin abundance and its grazing impacts. As a result of that survey we worked out there was probably a bit over 5 million urchins back then. We then repeated those same surveys between 2016 and 2017 and we found that the urchin population had grown to over 20 million individuals. So this, this is a species that just was simply not observed in Tasmania prior to 1978. So 1978 at St Helens was the first place that this long spine sea urchin had been found on mainland Tasmania. And since then we've seen this population explosion of sea urchins. Their abundance per hectare is in the thousands, which is far higher than, let's say, the, the abundance of crown of thorn starfish that would trigger an outbreak on the Great Barrier Reef. So our problem here is, is thousands of times greater than that of the, the crown of thorns. But there are really strong links to fishing here. So what, what we've found over decades of research is, again, that this ounce of prevention is worth a tonne of cure. And we can find if we have really healthy predator populations on the reef before the urchins take hold and collapse the reef, then we're able to reduce the risk of it collapsing at all. So things like primarily the, the southern rock lobster is a predator of urchins. And the large rock lobsters, they are able to prey on, on the long spine urchin, which is really quite a large animal. So by having more of them out on the reefs, we can mitigate the risk of overgrazing occurring. And so one of the fisheries management tools we're doing on the east coast of Tasmania, we've got the, the east coast rock lobster rebuilding strategy, which is trying to rebuild the numbers of large lobsters on the coast as a, as a tool for keeping a lid on urchin numbers. Certainly localised grazing patches of urchins probably are a natural feature. One of the things urchins do is mitigate their risk of predation by hiding in cracks and crevices. And so you can see some very localised grazing. What we find though when we have very few predators in the system, the extent uh, of those barrens just increases massively. And not only does it, is it found around those really high relief boulder structures where the urchins can hide from predators, but it, it spreads out like wildfire across open paddocks. And so we get barrens forming on these open reef areas where if there were predators in the system, the urchins would just be knocked off. The first experiments that we ran were back in the early 2000s where we removed sea urchins from these little, what we call these incipient barrens patches, these little holes within otherwise healthy kelp bed. They were the very first warning sign that the, the ecosystem can collapse to these urchin barrens. And so we ran these experiments and we saw a really rapid recovery of the kelp bed. So where you remove the urchin, the kelp comes back in about 18 months and it, it looks as though the urchin had never been there. And we get all this really big recovery in, in all the little critters, about 150 other species that live amongst the kelp, they came roaring back. And so, so we could recover the, the ecosystem. So that was the first sort of signs here locally that urchins were clearly causing the problem. By removing them, we can actually recover these reefs. In Tasmania, we really have embarked on reef-based ecosystem management now. So we've got the, the urchin fishery that's really helping keep a lid on urchin numbers. So a lot of the harvesting of the urchin fishery 
really does help support the other fisheries. So we know where we remove those urchins, abalone numbers can come back on the reef. Basically, if you have an urchin barren, you don't have abalone persisting in any commercial quantities. While the giant kelp is not extinct locally as a species, it's certainly present. It's, it's just not dominating the reef anymore. If we want to have kelp forest, then we've got to work out how we might actually achieve this. A lot of people are talking about restoration at scale. There's not much uh, propagules out there on the reef. So we're trying to, I guess, have that intervention to, to seed some more propagules to the reef to see if we can reset the balance and try and get the giant kelp to locally dominate some little patches of reef again. And so we trialled outplanting giant kelp in the wake of the urchin harvest. And some of the results we saw were, were, were fantastic. And so we were seeding these overgrazed areas with kelp. They are able to then establish on the reef. And 18 months later, we, we saw some kelps really growing through very strongly. Even within 10 months, we had some of those kelps reaching the surface from about seven metres depth. Once we could get it to locally dominate, maybe we can expand out from that and, and, and regrow a, a forest scale. And hopefully maybe that forest can self-seed itself and, and provide a, a, an ecosystem that's, that's been missing for, for, for more than a decade in this bay.